So we'll be working through questions about the, the relationship between Canadian and German publishers. They're both leaders in the publishing industry. Um, first, I'd like to ask, what role can German translators and independent presses play in making Canadian writers known in Germany? I actually first want to start by saying that I find it very interesting in Canada. I actually live part-time in Canada and part-time in Germany, so I'm really familiar with both worlds. Though in Canada, I live uh, in Quebec, in Gatineau, so in a French-speaking part of the country. So um, my French is much stronger than my English, actually. Uh, but I also, I live on the border of the Francophone and the Anglophone part of of uh, Canada because Gatineau was very close to Ottawa, right? So, um, but most of the books I translate from Canada are actually from French. So I'm a little bit more an expert on translation between Francophone Canada and Germany than Anglophone Canada and Germany, but I also do translate from Anglophone Canada. And what struck me is really in, in Anglophone Canada and Quebec is that you, everybody who lives in Canada is a Canadian author. Whereas in Germany, the perspective is a little bit different when you're in exile or you're an immigrant, you kind of, your nationality stays those of your home country and you don't necessarily become a German author that easily. And um, so that's one thing I really like about Canada. It's very, uh, in, uh, it encompasses, um, uh, like the three books we're talking about today are all N none of it is set in Canada, like we said, so, but it's considered Canadian literature, which is great. And as for the role that translators and independent presses can play in making Canadian writers known in Germany is that I feel like, especially for political books, like the three books we're talking about today, uh, the big publishing houses who more, who work with agents, uh, they have their books represented by agents in foreign countries. It's um, it's a different audience, right? But the small independent presses like Guernica and Nautilus, which are the Canadian publisher and the German publisher of Ava Fermeri's book, um, they really look for these more particular books like political books or literary political books, right? And Translators can really play a crucial role, role because the small publishing houses, um, maybe Katarina can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they don't have the resources to be aware of all the markets around the world. So we translators, we, when we are interested in a language or a country and we know the literature very well, well, it can be our role to be those ambassadors and get to know all these books, the authors, and then talk to them, talk about them to our publishers in Germany. So I have my contacts in Germany with the publishers I'm, I'm used to working with and that I like working with, like Nautilus. And then I have contacts to Canadian publishing houses and also to authors, right? And so I really play this role to be a, a mediator, uh, like a literary scout almost. So and it's not very formal, like I, I don't sign contracts or I don't get money for it or I don't write long presentations of the books. It's more like I read a lot and uh, the books I like and that I would love to translate and that I think can find an audience in, in Germany. Then I will talk about these books to my German publishers. And the last thing I want to add is that there's also great funding for that. So there's always funding from the original language. So for Canada, for example, we have funding from uh, the Canada Arts Council, but every province also has Arts Council who, who can fund these kind of projects like translations of Canadian authors in foreign languages. We also have the Canadian embassies in the, in the country it's itself, like the Canadian embassy in Berlin in Germany is very active in promoting Canadian literature and works with us translators in helping us bring Canadian literature to Germany and which is great. And also in Germany, we have institutions like the Deutsche Übersetzerfonds, which is the German translators fund, who also give grants for us translators to go look for books and then present them to German publishers. So it's really, people start to see that translators can really, really play this 
role of bringing books to uh, small independent presses in Germany. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, um, I um, I completely agree with Sonia. I, I would let, just like to add that um, actually uh, this book is one of the rare. Uh, mostly, we, our our books are proposed to us by translators. Sometimes, when we are looking for a book for um, a Frankfurt Guest of Honor program, sometimes we even ask translators if they don't have a an idea for us. Translators who know us very well. But I, I would just like to add that. We do work with agents. I mean, we don't. Uh, we don't. We have some working for us, but there are really uh, some devoted and, and passionate agents who sometimes um, give a book to us, or, or, or who, who know who we are. And um, I, I don't think they can make the money they need with that. But I think there are some agencies who really place books well with smaller independent publishers. And um, um, I think sometimes independent presses are more daring or more flexible. And I think it might be sometimes better for an author to be, let's say, the first author and the, the, um, the star in a smaller publishing house than, let's say, number three or four in the catalog with a very big house. Uh, um, for media attention, for example, when we, when we get something, usually our first and second place, we do get the media attention for it. So it might be maybe, and only maybe smaller in sales, but I think for media attention and for really getting known and, and getting read, I think that's what every author wants to, to get read. And I think it, it might be even preferable for some authors to be in independent uh, presses. So just to make it. Just yeah, I, I, I would actually like to know how Ian and Ariana, you found your German publishing houses and your translators. How did that came upon? Yes, mm, I can answer that. Before, let me, can you hear me well or do you have a, yes. Um, <laughs> First of all, I would like to say that I, I, would really I would really like to thank all small presses for being there and doing all that hard work of trying to survive in the publishing market because I think small presses uh, play a fundamental role in Germany as elsewhere. The, these small presses are the ones who dare to publish unknown or relatively unknown authors and make them visible on the international scene. So we as readers and as writers would, would re really, need to really need to support small presses and their publications, which represent the most vital force, the blood life, uh, uh, of the publishing market. Having said that, uh, I was very, um, as, a, as, as an unknown or relatively unknown writer in the international scene, uh, I have uh, myself tried to help my publicist uh, at Guernica, trying also uh, to find a, a publisher, in particular, in that, this particular case, a German publisher, uh, having in mind that uh, Frankfurt 2020 would have Canada as a guest of honor. And so I also sent out a, a couple of messages myself, and I was lucky enough to receive a, a positive answer from Catherine Nas Nicely of Palmart, Palmart Press uh, in Berlin. Uh, and she immediately got interested in, in my story and uh, in the novel. And uh, so the, 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 par the partnership uh, started, uh, struck straight away in a very positive way. Also, uh, thanks also to the translator, Hedy Freileiner, Freileiwer, who uh, started translating the, the book in German. So, uh, it's Ian, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. So, uh, for small presses, translation is a, a real challenge. Partly because the funding usually coming from the government only covers 50% of the costs. And translation is very expensive. And so in Canada, it's usually easier to publish in English a, a novel written in English or publish in French, uh, rather than paying for 50% of the translation. And I imagine it's very similar in Germany. 
the other element, of course, in translation is the authors don't live in the country of the that the, the uh, novel is going to be translated into. So it's uh, really a question of courage for small presses to take the time and you know to uh, to invest in a foreign author and to bring that author into first to have it, the author translated and to bring the author into their country and to promote the author without necessarily having the author present to help in book signings and all these type of things. But I think it's a very important function because literature should not be hemmed in by national borders or linguistic borders. You know, For literature to work, to change society, to have a social element to it, it's best if uh, it can cross borders, it, that people can read in different languages. And I'm very happy, in fact, that not only is my novel being translated to German, but this week I went to Spain and I, uh, I helped launch the Spanish translation of my novel, In Mercia, Spain. And uh, I got to know the publishers down there, the translators, and it was really an amazing experience. So for in literature, uh, being part of you know, having your novels translated and being available in different markets is an extremely exciting things, thing for authors. It's a difficult, difficult thing for presses to do, so uh, we have to recognize the role of publishers in doing this, especially small presses. Thank you. I just want to join, uh, add a little small thing at the end because Ian just said that the authors can't be present in the country to promote their book, and that's also where we translators can play a crucial role because uh, we really start to be more out on the open now. Like before our job was very much hiding behind a computer or a typewriter and just focusing on the book. But now we start also to do like um, panels talking about literary translation and the challenges of, of literary translation and also um, uh, present books and do readings and just read from our books without an author being present. Before it was kind of considered weird because you needed an author to be on a panel or to do a reading, but now translators really start to have this role too, which is exciting. I, I, I love to do it with my authors too, that's not what I want to say, but it can be fun also to focus on the aspect of translation. I, I was going to add that Sonia and I actually live in the same city in Canada. We, we both live in Gatineau and we didn't know that and we're going to go for a coffee. Uh, maybe in a month or so. So the world is very small. Yes, it is. It definitely feels that way today, too. Um, I think it's really interesting how so much of translation depends on, it really depends on the human connection and just doing the networking and meeting people and, and, and having these sorts of, hey, I know this translator or this publisher that might like this and, and having that connection. Um, I know also from the publisher side that Sometimes with translation, a lot of times someone, either a foreign rights agent or the publisher or publicist, will be presenting several books at once. And there might be one or two that stand out, usually probably just one. And so it's not just about the connection, but it's also about the book as well. And it comes down to choosing a book that speaks to you that might that might be viable in, in that language. Um, what are the considerations made by small presses when choosing to present a Canadian author in German translation? Katerina? Well, well yeah, um, <laughs> thank you. Well, first of all, the, the considerations uh, are um, the same with any books. I mean, um, translation or not, they, they, have to be a, they have to be good. It has to be a good novel or really good uh, non-fiction books. Uh, quality first. I think that's really important. We are not the kind of publisher who would, I don't know, absolutely want to participate in a debate or, or publish something that seems to be uh, on vogue right now. And um, th they also must fit uh, in our uh, editorial line, in our publishing profile. We have had many projects that we personally love, but we think we couldn't really represent so well. And uh, that, that sounds hard, but um, believe me, even with that, that selection, that leaves us uh, with far more projects that we could possibly publish. So then we try to, we, we try to consider what, what would be um, 
a topic or a, a subject that might be interesting now. And for us, Ava for Mary's books, beside being a literary um, jewel, we also thought that the, the topics she's writing about um, are um, really, and sometimes for, for, for everything, the, the love to the mother and the, the neglection of the parents and this all this relationship, that is something that is, I think that touches everyone, but the special situation in um, the just founded Iran, uh, Islamic Republic of, of Iran, that is something that would interest people here because there's a big Iranian community in Germany and um, I think there are a lot of people who are very well read and there is a discussion going on on that. So that was something that we took into consideration. But uh, even if we work with passion, we, we always have to keep an eye on the economic side too. So this is what, what Ian and Sonia already said, that the question of funding is sometimes quite crucial. When we have the choice between two books, that would both fit very well, but we only can publish one novel and one is likely to get funding and the other maybe not. So I have to admit that sometimes, well, most of the times we would choose, um, we would choose the one with funding. And usually to apply for funding, you already have to, to have signed the contract when you apply for it. It's the book you would do anyhow, but just knowing that there is the Canada Arts Council or the, the Canada 2020 program when more than 50% of the translate, translation costs were funded, that would help. And um, uh, for Ava for Mary, this is different because she has to, to stay anonymous, so she wouldn't travel anyway, but with other authors, it would help, it helps us too, when if we know that an author would be able to come to Europe or to Germany like Ian did uh, to present and to promote the book. And if there's uh, help in funding or even in organization, if there are, I don't know, the, the cultural institutes who help uh, having the author travel, that that might help for consideration too, because we think we could get uh, the, the media attention would be easier to get. So the, it's it's different. It depends really on the book, but there are some uh, aspects like these that we always talk about. How we could promote and get the book and get it get it to be known. Actually, I I, I was going to add a, a very important point for Canadian publishers is the funding that comes for the publishers to attend the Frankfurt Book Festival and the London Book Festival, or Book Fair rather, in order to meet you know, German publishers or British publishers or French publishers uh, without the ability uh, uh, to provide funding to these small presses, it would be difficult for them to make the connections that are needed to promote their books. So that, that is a very important element uh, in, in all of this, I think. Uh, but the other element is just the books. If the books do not appeal to a public in Germany, I don't think many publishers will take them on. So they're there are some books that are really work in Canada, uh, but in Germany they may not work. Uh, so that, that's interesting. And there may be some books we publish in Canada that work moderately well, and would, in Germany would be a huge success because of the themes that they cover. If I may jump in here, I, I, I totally agree with um, Ian that uh, one of the main questions, I guess, that German publishers ask themselves when choosing to translate any author, not only a Canadian one, is, is there something in this book that can resonate with the German audience? So it needs to have um, something to do with the subject matter, a specific social issue or a particular setting or the growing interest in a particular culture. So, for example, in the case of the Africana, I thought this uh, book would um, appeal to a, to a German audience, to German readers, uh, because the story is mainly set in Namibia, a country which has historical ties with Germany. Namibia, uh, as we all know was colonized by the German Empire in the 19th century and Germany is now Namibia's biggest donor of development aid. So there is, it has kept those historical ties also uh, out of the sense of responsibility and reparation for what happened in the past. Uh, so I think that this is something that reader might also relate to together with the fact that um, uh, Zoe, the, uh, the, pr the protagonist of my book, 
needs to deal with a sense of guilt for having been born, raised, and lived in a um, white Afrikaner privileged environment while uh, during apartheid South Africa. Um, and so, again, uh, this is something that also Gemma readers might relate to. So how does one cope with this sense of guilt? How does an individual, a community or a whole country find their place and dignity after injustices and atrocities have been committed in the past? And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ariana. I, that makes total sense to me that the publishing industry in a country would would be responsible to the communities of that country that the country is responsible to. Um, with that in mind, is contemporary Canada with its large pool of immigrant writers a new crossroads for cross-cultural literature? Yes, this is uh, definitely uh, what happens in Canada. Um, Am I right? Uh, 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 should I answer this question or? Please do, please do. yeah, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. <laughs> yes. So Canada is at the forefront in producing and granting visibility to authors who write across borders as we have seen here in this panel. This richness of cultural influences, this cross-pollination between cultures has produced some remarkable literary su successes and results and open the doors to stories set in a variety of contexts and faraway lands. Let's take, for example, Michael Ondaatje, who landed in Canada from Sri Lanka when he was just a boy and wrote that beautiful and now very well renowned novel, The English Patient, a tale of romance and wartime intrigue set between the Sahara and a Tuscan villa in Italy. His book co-won the Booker Prize in 1992 and also um, was adapted to the screen um, and so won multiple Oscars. And the same, something similar happened to um, Ian Martel, um, Spanish-born writer, the author of Life of Pi, the story of a Tamil boy stranded uh, on a boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean together with a tiger. And also this book has been successfully adapted to the screen. And also let's not forget about uh, uh, Alberto Manuel, the Argentinian-born writer who embraced Canadian citizenship. So you see, Canada uh, is offering to these writers, these naturalized Canadian writers, as I am, for example, um, is, so he's offering what? A stage, a platform for this kind of cross-cultural works and transcultural literary works. Thank you, Ariana. Ian, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to add to that. You know, in my regular life, I'm almost retired. I have one more day of work to do when I go back to Canada, and then I'll officially be retired from the Canadian Foreign Service. Uh, but one of my assignments was to be head of the political section of the embassy in Berlin. And one of the themes that we covered was uh, integration of uh, immigrants in German society, because the Germans were very interested in the situation in Canada, and uh, how we dealt with multicultural culturalism, how we integrated, uh, you know, uh, newcomers into our society. And what is really uh, amazing in Canada is how rapidly authors that don't have English as their first language or French acquire the language and begin to publish in that language and to write in that language and to be assisted by Canadian publishing houses in fixing up their grammar and their prose in order to get their story out there. And I had a Facebook message from a friend in Montreal who's an Iranian author, and she told me you know, she just found a publisher for her novel, which I had read in draft form, which was a very interesting story, but grammatically it was a huge challenge. So I think there's this openness in Canada with the publishers when it comes to immigrant authors that they don't expect perfection in the language. They're looking for the story and they're looking for the humanism. And this is something very, very unique 
I, I think in Canada, it may exist in some other countries, but in most countries, you know, if you submit a manuscript to a publisher and there's a lot of flaws, grammatical flaws, it's not going to go very far, no matter how interesting the story is. In Canada, we have publishers that are willing to invest their time in bringing those stories to the marketplace. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to add something to that, actually, because uh, Ava Fameri, her native language is not English neither. It's uh, Farsi, and but she wrote her novel in English, right? And I translated it from uh, English into German. And um, I found that um, I would really not call it grammatical flaws because I think like it adds something to the novel actually because some of the sentences are not sentences that a native English speaker would write like this. But, uh, and also sometimes she uses expressions like um, idiomatic expressions from uh, Farsi and just translate them literary into English and it, it makes a, a crazy image, but it works and it, it becomes poetry and literature and it's really beautiful. But it was an extra challenge during the translation to sort out what what part of her language was actually not English, but Farsi. And, and I mean, we exchanged a lot of emails and talked about her way of using the language, but I think it can really enrich the English language, uh, those authors. Um, that uh, don't speak English as a native language, but use it as their ling language of writing. That's and I want to add another example of how this works in Canada. Um, there's a Guernica poet, his name is uh, Henry Beissel. He was born in Germany. He was uh, adolescent at the end of the war and uh, his area of Germany was under British occupation. So he started to learn, started to work for the British Army a bit and he learned English and the like. And when he discovered uh, some of the things that happened under National Socialism, he revolted. He decided that he would never be German again. He was going to leave the country and was turning his back on Germany. And he did. And he went to England and they came to Canada. And he was, became, Eventually, he got a university education and became a university professor and the like. So he started to write in English. He started to write his poetry in English. And he became published in English and very well known. He's an older man. He's almost 90 years old now, I believe. But a few years ago, his poetry, which is very powerful poetry with a very strong social element and also autobiographical element that has relevance to Germany, was translated back into German by a publisher here in Germany, uh, Lit Literaturwissenschaft, which is doing my translation of my book. And now several of his books are being published in, uh, in German. And he's bringing back that entire expatriate experience back to Germany as a man who is, again, almost 90. And there's this historical aspect in this cultural aspect. And had Henry never left Germany, had he never gone to Canada, he would have never been a published poet. He would have been, I don't know, working as a worker or doing something in Germany. He would have never achieved academic fame. So this immigrant experience, which is quite unique, is something that I think can happen in our country in Canada. I must sound very proud of Canada, but I think that this can happen in Canada and in many countries it simply cannot happen. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I'd, like, I'd just like to add a quick sentence at the end sure, for yeah. this, because when we talk about uh, cross-cultural literature, of course, uh, now we're talking about uh, immigrant literature, but we cannot forget that we have a very, very rich indigenous literature in Canada too, which is a cross-cultural experience because it's from the, the First Nation um, that the writer comes from, the culture, and then the English or French um, mainstream culture that they are surrounded with or they interact with. So this is the, a very specific thing for Canada too, which when we translate these experience into German, I have translated a few um, indigenous authors from, from Quebec. Um, it's, um, it's something that in Europe we're not used to because we don't have this cross-cultural experience. We have the immigrant liter literature cross-cultural experience, but we don't have the, the First Nation cross-cultural experience, and it's something very exciting and very prolific right now in Canada.
if I can also add just one little bit, um, when interviewing a, an author like um, um, the, or the Bulgarian, German author uh, of Bulgarian origins, uh, Ilya Trojanov, who is uh, uh, the author of the Delton, the Delton, Der Welten Zemmler, so the collector of words, uh, I don't know whether I have pronounced it correctly in German, so the collector of words, he said to me that uh, German, um, as much as English or our global, let's say, languages uh, like French, is open to this kind of um, so is open to this kind of also uh, linguistic uh, and literary experimentation. So it's a language that can um, also. Um, attract writers who try also to be experimental because they, they, they come from different cultures and need also to find their own voice and the, in, in a different language. I don't know if this is uh, the, uh, I, I understand this is also a case for German, not only for English, which as a global language, language has also been enriched by all these different cultural inf influences uh, across uh, the, the last decades, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ariana. I think it's true with, I mean, when we think of German philosophy, there is such a potential for a play and for making up new concepts. And, and I think that leads itself well to having people come in from a different language and, and to experiment and play. And Sonia, thank you so much for sharing that about the indigenous literature. We have such an indigenous, um, a, such, an, a, such a rich indigenous literary culture here in Canada. So it's exciting to know that people are interested in bringing that outside and into the rest of the world. Um, and thank you also, Ian, for mentoring Henry Biesel. In 2020 and 2021, actually, we, um, well, Ger Guernica Editions authors had their books translated into German. We had four Guernica authors. Three of those were uh, immigrants as well. And Henry Biesel's collection, Cantos North, will also be translated into German in 2021. How has the literary climate in Canada offered space to these authors that might not be possible in their home countries? Ian? Oh, I'll ask you to. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on. Actually, it was to answer that question, I, I think uh, Henry Biesel's example was, was a perfect one. And Abba's uh, book is probably a perfect one. I'm, I'm sure that had she stayed in the Islamic Republic of Iran, her book would have never been published, you know. Um, it's not just Canada, also in Germany, you know, there are people that come to Germany, a lot of Syrians have come here, the refugees, Palestinians, Turkish people, and they're finding their literary voice in Germany because Germany is a very tolerant society in that sense, a very cultural society. So I think there are a number of countries in the world where they are really vehicles of enabling and facilitating people from all over the world to speak through literature. And I would include in, in that, I would include, of course, the United States. Uh, despite the politics of the United States, the United States has historically been a very extremely important country in bringing people of different cultures together uh, from Afghanistan, from the entire world, and to produce literature of extremely high value and uh, universal in nature. If I can add to, to that, Ian, um, this is more so with uh, um, countries which are historically founded on immigration, such as Canada, the United States, and Australia. So, for example, Canada, uh, not only it is founded on immigration, but it also has a multicultural policy like Australia, for example, that allows people to integrate in uh, mainstream society, but at the same time maintain and uh, retain their heritage uh, culture. So because of that, uh, Canada welcomes and honors cultural diversity. Myself as a writer, I have found here um, uh, not only a literary system interested in and supportive of 
my writing, but also a way to access a wider audience, also across uh, Canada's border, thanks to Canada's two official languages, which are both global languages, as I was already mentioning, English and French. I think there's another element to Canada that Ariane has talked upon, upon. It's the languages that we speak as our official languages, English and French. You know, the Canadian authors are increasingly uh, successful in the North American market and also in the UK. Uh, Margaret Atwood is everywhere in the English speaking world. And so in some ways, you know, our efforts in Canada to bring about new voices to the forefront uh, have an impact that go beyond our borders. And I think this is a very important thing. We, we don't really, we talk about Canadian literature, but in reality in Canada, it's not Canadian literature. It is literature and some of it has world value and some of it is more localized in the setting, but it is literature that is meant for a much broader audience than just the Canadian public. And that includes, of course, our indigenous writers who, uh, in Germany, I, after living four years in Germany, I, I understand the fascination of Germans with the indigenous cultures of North America. And I think that we will find that the indigenous authors translated to German will find a large public in, in Germany to, uh, to, to, to support their work, which will be something that will be very appreciated in Canada by these authors because they often come from marginalized communities where it has been difficult for them to succeed academically or culturally or to express their voice. And now we have the Canadian government supporting them. And we have, you know, German publishers taking a chance on these authors who are not very well known and bringing their story to, to Germany. And again, as I said, I think that these type of stories will be very well received in Germany. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah. Can I add a small answer to that question? So to come back to that question of how the literary climate in, in Canada offers something to writers that would not be possible in their home country. Um, in the case of my author, Ava Fameri, um, she came to Canada um, and, uh, from Iran and uh, she lives in Canada in exile. And she told me when I asked her this question, she said in Canada for the first time, she found that her values of humanism were shared in, in a larger society and her opinions were listened to and respected. And she re is really grateful to have found a publisher like Guernica and then Nautilus in Germany that um, feel like a book like hers in all its harshness, but also all its poetic lightness, um, but it's not an easy read. I mean, it's not a book that you would give to your aunt or your niece for Christmas because uh, if she wants to read a happy book, right? So it's a, um, it can be a difficult read, but to have publishers who have this courage to translate, to, to, to publish and have translated these books is really important for an author like Ava Fameri. And she said the, that, in Canada, for the first time, she felt safe to express what she sings, and that's very important, right? So she also wants to us as a Western society to understand the importance of uh, freedom of speech. Thank you, Sonia, and Katerina, with the leftist anarchist publisher, a publishing house. Do you find that authors who maybe aren't don't have the space to tell their stories elsewhere come to you instead of even having to seek them out? Um, yeah, we we, um, we have published uh, three novels by uh, an author from Iraq, uh, Abbas Kidar, who uh, changed for a bigger publishing house now, but uh, <laughs> that happens too. But we published his first novels and. Uh, um, he had a, a story of, uh, well, he, he fled from Iraq and it was, his story is really hard too and he, he has been tortured and we have um, another book with by um, a young, um, really young um, 
men from um, uh, Iraq too, and, and Kurdis, uh, a young Kurd from Iraq. And uh, he was actually the youngest person in Iraq ha ha having um, been tortured ever, which is, um, it always feels strange uh, for me to say that because it was like as, as if it was a kind of uh, record, but he was, uh, he was actually jailed when he was 14 and he, uh, uh, he has been a lot in danger and he was, uh, he has come to Germany and uh, because the, um, he couldn't be, he, actually he, um, he became an atheist and this is what was dangerous for him because there are um, some people who, um, who think that is inadmissible and he, he really is in he has been in danger in uh, Iraq and sometimes is in danger even in uh, in Germany and this is really crucial for us because it's amazing how hard the work still is to to really I mean I, I, as you see in my st stuttering I haven't prepared my answer but I, let me just uh, take some time because um, I think it's important we have the freedom of speech granted in our in our law and I think everybody subscribes to it you not you have to the freedom of speech and everybody can can contradict you as well so this is I think important but actually you get hurt quite often and uh, it's it's impressive to see what this young author um, how often he, he 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 can express what he thinks but it's really dangerous and it's really hard for him to do so so this is why we published his book too because um, we want to, we want the, the debate to go on, and we want people really to say, okay, you can subscribe to that, but do you really um, act like you do it every day? So, um, mm, yeah, it's not something we search, but I think as a political and literary publishing house, we we often publish books that are political books in in several ways. So yeah, I, I think I could think of some more uh, of our authors who who fit into that um, into that category of ca category of authors. It's such a close relationship. I mean, it's it's easy to think of this as a as a business, and it is a business as well. But it's also a very close, intimate relationship with the authors and and with representing their voices and, and making de decisions that are are very important for them and, and, and for communities and then bringing that to the world as a whole. It's, it's a huge. Yeah, I think, I think especially with, with authors who really uh, publish a very, very personal book. I mean, that putting their inside out and really exposing themselves and maybe getting in danger too. So I think it's, it's a collaboration. We have to rely, to, to, to rely upon each other actually. And we, we try to always be, be behind our authors and we meet them and they know everybody at our house personally. I mean, if ever it's possible. We haven't met Eva Femeri, but that's an exception. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can German translation now add an international dimension? Um, this literary what, with, with this project. Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> um, I um, I think that uh, all the books we've talked about they are they are already profoundly uh, international. I mean they are international books, and uh, I think that's the whole point of translating. Why do we translate books, and why we, do we read? Everybody reads translation because we want to get to know other people countries other times also so um and i believe that in maybe more or less complicated ways but sooner or later somehow there is an international reaction i mean maybe having read Eva femeri's book in german that might influence other german writers and it somehow gets back to an international literature so i think that's really the, the whole point of, of translating literature but uh to get back to a uh, mere market kind of view. I think it's important also that I mean German is not a small language. We we distribute our books in in Germany, of course, but also in Switzerland and Austria and Luxembourg. And uh, I think that it might encourage uh, uh, publishers from other European countries if they see that there is a German translation. So maybe they think, okay, there really must be an international dimension to, to this book. I mean, it's the same way we look also, if, if we, we are considering a book that there, let's say, is already a French or a Spanish trans or Italian translation. So we, we tend to consider it 
uh, with more attention to see, okay, well, what did they see in there and did that work out? So I think any, any translation will help to promote further translations. If I can add something to this, especially after Brexit, um, I have a feeling that Germany is really becoming the door to Europe. Uh, before England, the UK would become the, the, the main, you know, so the, the parameter. So if a book was uh, published in London, in England, then also other publishers in Europe would follow. But now, uh, let's think also the fact about the fact that Germany's publishing market is the biggest market in the European Union. So if a book is published in German, other publishers across Europe take due notice of that. And, and, and this is uh, something that is happening more and more, especially as I was saying after Brexit. Uh, I was going to add, you know, on the international aspect of publishing, Germany is uh, one of the great crossroads of the world. I'm sitting in the city of Frankfurt right now. Frankfurt Airport receives people from all over the world. Uh, near my hotel here, there's what they call uh, Frankfurt's Heart of Africa, where yesterday uh, I ate injera and sherawat. Those are Ethiopian dishes. For the first time in more than 25 years, I used to live in Ethiopia, worked there for several years. But I, you know, I see that in German society, and I, I've lived here before, but more and more, you know, people come to Germany. Uh, they come, educate people come to Germany. People come as refugees, political refugees to Germany as, as well. And that Germany is becoming a, a meeting place, a treffpunkt for the entire world. So for Canadian authors to be translated to German, we, we know that our books will not just be read by German speakers, people born German speakers, but they'll be read by other people in Germany who have acquired German as their cultural and literary language, which is very interesting. And I hope that uh, when my German translation comes out that there will be some Germans of uh, Arabic origin that will take the time to read it and appreciate some of the things that I've tried to portray in, in that book. So uh, Germany has a certain importance that you don't find necessarily in other European countries. Would anyone like to add to that before we move on to the Q&A? Thank you, Ian. All right, so we do have some questions. The first one is from Aurora, who says, Hi, everyone there. I'm the Spanish translator of Quill of the Dove, and I wanted to ask Sonia how much of herself she thinks she has put in her German translation in terms of emotion, individual feeling, etc. Sonia? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think if I would not put, I, I mean, I think it's it's impossible to not put anything of myself in my translation. And if I would try to stay out of it the most possible, it would become a kind of very boring text. I mean, I have to create create literature, right? So in order to do that, I have to, like I said at the beginning, when I look at the character, I really start to picture this character as a full human being with all their quirks and quarks and their way of talking and their way of moving and their way of thinking and feeling and being in the world. And then I try to imagine myself how this human be being would talk if their language was German. And that's the whole trick about literary uh, translation. But it co of course, it's my interpretation kind of of this this character of, in, in my case, Ava Fameri's novel, the character Shada, is it's my interpretation of how I see her and how I, but it, I, I actually, I, I became very close with her. It almost felt like I was her best friend and it was a funny way because she has a very different reality from mine, having grown up in Iran and being in prison, the, the character in the book, not the author. But um, yeah, I, and then I started to talk about, I started to write emails to the author and sometimes she would answer as Shada. So I had a conversation with Shada actually about her way of talking. And of course, she started to speak 
Sonia, think German because my German is of course um, formed by all my experience. So yeah, there's a lot of myself in the German text, even if it's another person's story. The story and the character originally is from the author, but the way she talks now in German is, is of course my way of letting her talk. That's so cool that the language is woven right into right into the book. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Martin Kuster. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. We are mostly talking about novels here. I know that the translator for Verlag Literaturwissenschaft translates both poetry and prose. What about the other translators? Does anyone speak to this? of translating outside of just uh, fiction novels? Well, uh, I, I do um, translate dramatic texts to also translate for the theater, but I don't translate poetry uh, with the exception that sometimes in novels uh, you would have poetry and then you have to translate it, right? But I don't, it's a whole different kind of literary translation poetry, I feel. and. Uh, one has to be specialized in, or like the focus has to be on poetry. And my focus is on prose, on novels and on theater. I don't know about my translator, actually, if uh, she's also translating from poetry. Uh, but um, I think as uh, Sonia is saying that you either, it's most, of, most of the time translators of poetry are also poets themselves. And this adds that kind of uh, specific uh, literary sensibility you really need to have to translate poetry. I think it's a whole new dimension. And uh, kudos to those who are able to do both. Um, it's funny, I, I actually translated, I write in English, I'm a poet, but I also uh, am bilingual in French as well. And I translated my first poem from English into French. Normally I would do the other way. And it was a very interesting exercise. And to me, the most important was to, to capture the emotion and then to find the right, in the way that, a, that the language, the sounds of the words and the rhythm relate in the original language. It was about finding the emotion and then finding the aesthetic language and not getting too, too caught up in the exact translation in between. So it was more at those edges, um, which maybe poetry is a little bit more at the edges than, than narrative prose. Um, we do have another question. Uh, translations or trans translation belle plume has a question, uh, or sorry, had, a, had a, something to say in response to Sonia when she was speaking about um, through the sadwood being uh, from a Farsi speaker writing in English. Good point. I translated a book by Ahmed Dani Ramadan, Vancouver English language author born and raised in Syria, and the Arabic was transpiring through the English, both an enrichment of the work and literary scene in Canada, but also a bit of a challenge for a translator. Very true. Anvi Huang has a question as well. I support independent publishers such as Guernica and its German counterpart. I'm confused and disheartened to hear terms like small press and big press. Aren't we doing ourselves a great disadvantage by grading ourselves as small press when we represent the 99%? The term small press creates a damaging psyche on the speakers and on readers as well when it comes to choosing books to read. We can still do everything we are doing without calling ourselves small. What do you think? If I can add straight away, I, I think it's a, a very interesting uh, question and, and it's a statement and I agree totally with, um, I think she's, uh, who is saying that? And, Sorry. We, and, uh, and yes. she will be publishing a book next spring with Granica. Okay, yeah. yes. And I think instead of calling them small presses, I think in, in Canada, we usually say independent presses, independent publishers. And I think this is a better way of you know, describing them. They are independent. They don't belong to a big like um, corporation, like publishing corporation, and gives them a, 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 a better light. So they put them under a better light, being independent. Katerina? 
sorry, I have some trouble with the unmuting. Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, you're, you're right, and I get that point. But I just want to add that I'm sorry, but the the size in the sense of the, the number of books published and then the, the, just the, the, the money, someone has the capital that is behind that is not completely um, out of consideration. And there are very big independent publishing houses that we compete with. It's, I think it's, I, I, I agree, it's, it's good. It sounds better. And it, I think it's, it puts forward the strength to say independent publisher, but they are very small independent publishers and you have to struggle with it. I mean, we, we, have, to, we have to struggle and to compete for media attention. And it, it, of course it matters if there's a bigger, and I say bigger publisher who can pay for, let's say uh, four whole page advert, uh, advertisements, uh, they are more likely to get also a, a bigger piece in the journal, so that is something you have to deal with. So I think it's it's good for a pub, for a publicity to call it independent, but still it also matters. So we are as well independent and medium sized. I don't know. <laughs> we publish about uh, between um, let's say between sixteen and maximum twenty books a year, and we have five people working there. So to to get a comparison, I don't know. They are smaller publishers, but they are bigger too. Um, th th this is Ian. I don't know, you know, I like the term small press for Canada. I think uh, I can say that the small presses have a certain tradition that the larger commercial presses do not. And I think in some cases the smaller presses just are simply more creative than you would find in the case of very large presses. And we use the term in Canada and maybe it sticks and it means something to people. Um, it may not mean the same thing in, in Germany, you know, but in Canada there's almost a emotional attachment to this community of small presses that are doing extremely creative things in our country that are not being done by the larger presses. So I, I'm, I feel very comfortable with the word small press and it does reflect the fact that you know some of the presses don't have many employees uh, and the like but they're doing an excellent job as we say in english they're punching above their weight yeah maybe you should you should rather oppose larger commercial uh, publishing houses as you just did i think that's really the, the point maybe. thank you Bob. um i i have a a fun comment from traduction bad plume when I translate, I also become very familiar with the characters, as if I have new roommates for some months. I love that. So I would like to close with a comment from Connie McParland, who is Guernica's co-publisher, who is in attendance today, and she has left us with a note in the comments. And I think it's a great one to end on. I agree with both Ian and Ariana's comments about the openness to writers of different cultures in Canada. It was not always so. Guernica Editions was founded in 1978 precisely to publish writers from the margins that were not being published. Since then, the institutionalization of multiculturalism helped greatly, not to speak of the fact that so many writers from different cultures have produced some of the best writing in Canadian literature. And I agree with that 100%. So thank you to Sonia, Katerina, Ariana, Ian. Thank you everyone in attendance at Frankfurt. Thank you to everyone who joined us today virtually. Um, I would like to remind you that the best way to support, uh, to support the authors and to support indie presses is to actually buy the books. Another way to support is to read them and review them on Goodreads or Amazon. When you get your book shipments in, in the mail, take photos and put it on social media, talk about the books that you're reading. And when you read a book that you love, you can reach out to the author. You can usually find them on social media or you can let their publicists know that you love the book because authors do love to hear that and so do their publishers and so do their translators. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. And I will wish everyone a great day. Thank you to you, thank and you. Margo. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. <laughs> what an insightful discussion. Thank you.